I'm going to switch to a startup company and hopefully we'll have Nina join us momentarily. Hi, Nina. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So we're going to do an altogether different topic now than we've had yet today. And I'm happy to have another entrepreneur join us. Nina Kashatri is one of the women in our AWARE program, which helps to support female entrepreneurs and underrepresented populations. But she's also going to give us, I think, a really insightful um, example of how AI is being applied in water systems and for municipalities. Now, as she'll probably tell you, when she started her company and started thinking about this, this was still a pretty wacky, out there kind of concept. But increasingly, as we think about healthcare interests in our wastewater and how those might be used as diagnostics, this has become in the media a lot in 2020. So it's great to have Nina as an expert in civil engineering with us today and talking about Insartis, her company. Thanks, Nina. Thanks, Laura. Um... Yes, so I um, I uh, am just ass assuming that maybe folks on this um, uh, here at this uh, data summit may not be um, uh, you know down in the weeds and wastewater like I am. So uh, I wanted to kind of maybe uh, spend a little bit of time uh, setting the stage for the problem formulation. Um, so my company, Answerus. We're uh, developing waste. We're developing AI tools for wastewater management, and um, we founded our uh, in 2017, and we've been working in this field ever since. And kind of just to get uh, set the stage, our investments, uh, investment requirements in wastewater infrastructure. Uh, yeah, so um, we're focused on wastewater management using artificial intelligence and. In the wastewater field, um, we're seeing a, a real need for investment uh, across the board. In the United States, we're seeing that we're going to need $271 billion in investments over the next two decades to maintain and improve our wastewater infrastructure. And to say nothing of global markets, right now 80% of wastewater globally goes untreated. And um, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to sort of bridge that gap. The UN does have a sustainable development goal to um, have more uh, sanitation for all, but um, there's still a large gap there. So there's a, a real need for investment in this space of, of um, in the wastewater space. And uh, this is coming at a time where, you know, these investments are not going to be going away. We've seen historically that um, as population increases, wastewater treatment and management has progressed and become more and more complex. Uh, back in the 1800s, we didn't have any wastewater treatment or collection. And then we started to have underground pipes known as the sewer system. And then we started to have uh, treatment as well, but the treatment was just sufficient to uh, uh, enable discharge. And now we're finding that we're needing to not just treat for discharge, but really recover that wastewater and reuse it for different purposes, whether it be potable. Um, you know, some systems are actually recycling water for potable purposes. Some are recycling it for non-potable purposes like irrigation or toilet flushing. But we're really seeing that increase in complexity in um, the need for uh, more uh, wastewater treatment plants that can do more for us, really. And um, it, given the current climate of the need for more investment in wastewater treatment, and uh, uh, really um, we don't see that going away anytime soon, the mentality has really shifted at wastewater treatment facilities where they're trying to do more for less. Um, in previous, uh, you know, a few decades ago, we might see a wastewater treatment plant just being very happy with just meeting its discharge norms. But as energy prices have increased, as we've seen, there's been a financial burden on wastewater utilities. They're looking to do more for less and run more operational, um, run their operations more efficiently. And one of the areas where there's been a lot of interest is optimizing energy consumption at wastewater treatment facilities. There is a lot of energy required, even in a conventional facility that just treats for discharge. Um, about um, uh, three to 4% of the total energy consumed in the United States 
is used for wastewater treatment. And that's approximately $4 billion in spending uh, each year. And 40% um, of a wastewater utility's operational budget goes towards energy. And there's a large variation between different plants where the top uh, five uh, percent of energy consumers are 10 times more energy intensive um, than the bottom 5%. So you can see that there's a wide range of operational efficiencies, efficiencies with which uh, facilities are running. And another area of um, operational efficiency is chemical consumption. So a lot of these wastewater facilities require chemical consumption for their processes. And as we get to more complex treatment systems with more stringent discharge norms, that need for chemicals is actually increasing as well. And all this is happening at a time where we're having a brain drain in the sector. About 50% of wastewater operators are eligible for retirement. And we're not seeing that pipeline be filled as quickly as it needs to be. So there really is this loss of institutional knowledge at wastewater treatment plants at a time where this institutional knowledge is really critical to achieve operational efficiencies like we're talking about. We've conventionally relied on the wisdom of experienced operators. And another, you know, I guess background here is that we routinely at wastewater facilities collect a lot of diverse data. Um, these wastewater facilities, they are um, running automation systems. I mean, they're automated, so they need sensors that sort of run the automation systems and sensors to run the equipment. There's also a large variety of laboratory tests needed. Um, as Laura was uh, in, uh, indicating with COVID, of course, we're examining wastewater uh, for presence uh, in early detection of COVID. But also, you know, for decades, we've been testing wastewater samples for regulatory requirements and process optimization. And there's also a data coming in from the field where operators will go and check the health of the collection and distribution systems. And um, also public data is available that actually has an impact on the wastewater treatment facilities. So um, weather, for example, is a big one. A lot of these waste, most wastewater treatment facilities have a biological uh, reactor and there's actual biology in there doing the treatment and that has uh, the, the rate of reactions and how that biology can be healthily sustained. I mean, has a direct impact on the, on the temperature. Um, for example. So we have all these diverse data sets that are already available, which really makes this, um, you know, a, a ripe um, opportunity for using artificial intelligence tools to develop data-driven models to achieve those operational efficiencies that uh, wastewater treatment plants are looking to achieve. And um, it really is, um, it, it's it's a very uh, it's a space where the industry the wastewater industry is very excited about this potential opportunity in particular because um, modeling based on equations has proven difficult these are complex systems a lot of the times um, they're still under research you know what exactly is happening in this wastewater uh, treatment plant what's happening in the tank the biology is so complex that it's still being uh, understood at an academic level, you know, even though we've been using this, these systems for now, you know, um, you know, over a century. So, you know, the, even though the biology has been around for a while, we still don't fully understand it enough to sort of have real time deployment of any equation based uh, models. So data driven models are actually more easier to develop and, and implement in real time. And so um, there really is an opportunity there. And so uh, at Enceris, we are uh, providing what we call the AI wastewater stack. And um, it is this uh, it made of three layers. And you know, at the top layer, you see uh, an analytics as a service layer. Um, that's where we provide that real-time insight to the operators, um, ranging from optimal set points, um, real-time information on the energy and con chemical consumption and um, other relevant insights um, such as um, um, 
soft sensor uh, data. So sometimes uh, at a wastewater utility, you might want to understand a parameter in real time, but there's no means of doing so other than using surrogate sensor data and developing that real time parameter insight. So we call that a soft sensor. So we have this analytics as a service platform and that's uh, the middle layer of our stack is really the algorithms that we've developed for the different use cases. And at the bottom layer is the actual data. So um, that can be the sensors that are placed in various parts of the treatment facility, the meters that are in various parts of the treatment facility and other data like lab data or public data or the field data. And so this sort of uh, is, a, is a visual of the stack and we've, worked on projects where we provide the entire stack. We've also worked on projects where we might provide just the sensors and the um, algorithms, or we might provide the, the data is already there. We might provide the algorithms and the delivery platform. The commonality is there's always that um, AI component that we're involved with in all of our projects. And we've been lucky to uh, participate in a wide variety of projects. Some of our early projects were um, grant funded and we worked on an SBIR with the US Army. You can see uh, the little container there is a um, prototype of a mobile um, wastewater treatment system for the U US Army. And so we worked on a teeny tiny project that can be you know, a plant that can be put into a container. And we worked with the Met Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. You can see that huge you know, kind of empty tank there. That's actually a 7.9 billion gallon tank. It's 90 acres in area and 30, 300 feet deep. So, you know, from the smallest to the largest, and you know what the common thing is, AI has applications across the board. Um, and we're currently also working on uh, two other projects, an industrial wastewater treatment facility. Um, you see with the circle, uh, circular clarifiers and the rectangular tanks. And then the other picture there is a sewage treatment facility where they're using reusing the wastewater for toilet flushing and irrigation applications. And for these particular projects, we had different mandates. Uh, for the Army, they wanted us to classify the wastewater out of their treatment system to um, indicate to the operators whether that water was safe to discharge or safe to reuse. And the motivation behind that was that when they're in remote regions of the world and treating their water and wastewater, which they want to do so that they don't have to truck water and truck out wastewater, which is very costly, um, they want to know that they're not um, uh, polluting the environments that they're in. And um, this actually, there's a real world example where uh, UN peacekeepers in Haiti um, were operating a mission there and they introduced cholera into Haiti, which was, um, you know, which has been a, a real public health challenge ever since. So it really is a, the responsibility of, you know, they feel a huge responsibility to make sure that wherever they are, their water is being um, treated to appropriate standards, but they don't have the laboratory equipment that a large scale municipality might have to sort of do the, the testing that is done in a large scale municipal setting. So we had to develop um, AI based tools for them to um, to uh, to know if their wastewater is safe to discharge or safe to reuse. For the uh, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, they were interested in odor prediction. That that's a big stormwater reservoir, and the neighboring uh, uh, neighborhoods were complaining about odor. So they developed a, they wanted us to develop an odor prediction algorithm so they could take corrective action to treat the um, odor from that facility. And then for the two projects on the bottom, those are under, we're currently executing those right now. Both of them are recycle reuse projects and they're interested in energy and chemical optimization. So we're working with them to develop the entire stack. We're providing the sensors, the automation and the um, uh, delivery platform to optimize their energy and chemical consumption. And these are the techniques that we used in the various uh, projects we've worked on. Um, so for the Army, we worked on, we had supervised learning for odor, for the MWRD, we had supervised and unsupervised learning. And for both the optimization um, projects, we're working on reinforcement learning techniques. 
And so this is kind of where AI tools kind of fit into the system. Right now we're um, you know, bringing in historical data, um, training models, then we're um, doing real-time prediction, estimation, classification, and optimization using the real-time data. And ultimately the goal would be to seamlessly go back into the automation system with our set points that we're learning from AI tools to, to you know, come full circle with uh, integration into existing, um, existing systems at facilities. And um, that's all for my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Nina. Really fascinating to learn more about this and how it's changing and evolving. Before we close out or address other uh, perhaps technical questions, tell us a little bit what your entrepreneurial journey has been like. Uh, you mentioned getting SBIR funding. I know you've also been supported uh, uh, by, I think it's Moen, as their innovator in residence and had a variety of interesting experiences thus far. Uh, tell us about your journey. Yeah, so, you know, my journey, um, it's, I, I'd say it started back at Research Park. I was working in the co-working space there and I got to learn about, uh, for another company, actually, I was working for another company at the time and I got to learn about the SBIR program and I was very interested in doing something in the wastewater space that was entrepreneurial. And I, you know, I, I will say, I kind of went through different ideas and I think that, uh, even my interest in data was in data analytics was piqued by being in research park so and seeing other companies apply these tools to their field I thought you know this is really something I could apply to uh, the wastewater field I had had a lot of experience in um, designing and building wastewater treatment projects and commissioning them and during commissioning I got to commission the automation system so I you know very well aware of all the data that was uh, uh, already being collected and, and very well aware that not any analytics was being done. Um, and so that was really the start. I think being at Research Park really helped me, you know, bring my ideas together in this, in this space. And, um, and then the early grants were very helpful. I mean, the SBIR was my first project to be able to sort of proof of concept. Um, and then working with the MWRD, uh, we did that as part of a collaborative effort with the University of Illinois. Again, a great opportunity to do a demonstration project and really sort of test out the different layers of the stack. And um, and so, uh, yeah, and I, I guess, uh, you know, even um, now, you know, being surrounded by other companies in this space, uh, you know, with the Big Data Summit, I've attended it every year, I believe, since coming to, you know, Champaign. So um, it's, it's been um, it's been helpful to be uh, part of a community that has a lot of data, practical you know data science implementation going on. Thanks, Nina. So hopefully that is inspirational to those of you who are in other fields where you think data and AI might be applied and improve performance. Take Nina's story as motivation to um, use those skill sets and ideas to create better digital transformation in whatever field it might be. And if you've got expertise as she does in civil engineering or some other area where they perhaps are not as advanced as some of the fields like digital advertising you just heard about as well, um, there's an opportunity there and be a disruptor. So thank you, Nina, for joining us and sharing not only about Ansaras as a company working on wastewater, but your entrepreneurial journey.